Well, today, we're going to look at the launch, the start, the beginning of his public ministry, and there's four things I want us to see here that are really common in all of our lives. They all begin with a P, so if you're a note taker, hopefully these will be easy for you to write down and remember. First, we're going to see places. There's going to be 10 places mentioned in our passage today. So as I read it, you're going to hear place after place after place mentioned. And we often forget this. But one of the things that shapes our lives more than anything else is the places we've been, the places we've lived, the places we've grown up, the place we live now. All those things are important. Then we're going to see people mentioned in this passage. We're going to see at least seven or eight different people mentioned And people are vital. They shape us. They impact us. We impact other people. And then we're going to see a proclamation that Jesus is going to have a proclamation. And the truth for all of us, every one of our lives is proclaiming something. Whether we're intentional with that or not, all of our lives proclaim something that we value, that we care about, that we want people to know and that we give to others. And finally, we're going to see a purpose, that Jesus is going to call his disciples and give them a very simple purpose for their life. And all four of these things we see in our lives, all four of them apply to our lives. So we're going to journey through this passage. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 25. And again, we're looking at the launch of the ministry of our King Jesus Christ. So if you would stand for the reading of God's word, we'll start reading in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, Beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, a people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. For those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. While he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, He saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called to them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those who have seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, from Jerusalem and Judea, and from all the Jordan. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's people said, praise be to God. You may be seated. God, your word does declare that all men are like grass and all our glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fade. But your word, your word stands forever. And Lord, may this be the word that is preached today. We recognize that unless you speak, nothing of true significance is spoken here today. So speak, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, it starts off in this passage speaking of a time when John the Baptist had been arrested. We've just seen John's ministry, and I mentioned John's ministry was very brief. Most estimate it was shorter than a year, because John had a very specific mission. He was to point to Jesus Christ, to the Messiah. And what we even see is that many of John's followers, the large crowds that followed John the Baptist, would become the large crowds that followed Jesus Christ. 
When John has been arrested, Jesus withdraws from the area known as Judea. Judea is where Jerusalem is. And Jesus had been uh, in the area at the, around the Dead Sea where he was baptized, where John the Baptist's ministry was taking place. Now, he goes up to an area called Galilee. And Galilee is going to be very significant in Jesus' ministry. Know this, 11 of the 12 disciples are from Galilee. Only one disciple is not from Galilee. And that would be the disciple who would betray him named Judas Iscariot. So 11 of these men are from this area of Galilee. And I want to show you, we got a map here that you can see uh, the areas of um, Israel in Jesus' time. That yellow area up there is the area called Galilee. Now down south, the orange area, it says Judea. That's where all the religious people lived. And when I say religious people... In this context, it's often speaking of religious in a negative way. Meaning, these people were caught up in their religion. There wasn't much relationship with God or understanding of God. They were keeping the rules and oppressing other people with them. And that predominated temple life at the time of Christ. So you see, Judea in the south, Galilee in the north. Now between those two places is an area known as Samaria. And the Jewish people did not like the Samaritans. They viewed them as less than. And there's a few reasons for that. The Samaritans had been the people, they were the Israelites, who when the Assyrians in the Old Testament captured the Israelites, they were the ones who married one another. And they created a false religion called, uh, that was the Samaritan religion. And it was their religion that was rejected. Their religion was a bit bizarre. It was a little different. It was a lot like Judaism, but on some key things it was very different. So Jewish people would not walk through Samaria. They would walk all the way around. But one of the things I want you to see in this map, Capernaum is isolated. It's surrounded by foreign nations and by Samaria and to the religious prominence within Israel, they are isolated. If you were from Galilee, you'd be viewed as being from the rural area, from the area that's less educated, from the area that's less prominent. I know where I'm from, there's areas that people would consider the countryside, small town, rural, and people from the city would often look down on people from those areas. And that's how it was. If you were from Galilee, you were looked down upon. You're viewed as missing something, not having something. And know this, this is where Jesus grew up. It says in verse 13, leaving Nazareth. Jesus grew up in a small village called Nazareth of 500 people. One of the things that we all have in common in this room, not a single one of us chose our parents, chose the day of our birth, or chose the place of our birth. We didn't choose the places we grew up. Somebody else chose those for us. And Jesus would grow up in this small little town called Nazareth. And here's something also undeniable. The places we grow up have immense impact on our lives. They shape the way we view many different things. And many of us in this room, it's one of the things I absolutely love about our congregation here at IEC. We have people that come from many different places. Some, praise God, you were born and raised and you've always lived in Addis Ababa. Praise God for that. Others, you've come from different places in the world, different places in Ethiopia, different types of communities. I grew up in the United States in a very small town, in a very small state that's known for high poverty. The jokes about the place I grew up is People there marry their sisters, which isn't true, but that's the way people joke about it. So it's a place that's viewed for poor education and for um, things that aren't always becoming. The community I grew up in, the predominant work that people did was either farming or working in the coal mines. And coal mines was tough, difficult work. Growing up in that community shaped how I view much of the world. It hasn't limited, but it shaped that. 
We all have those experiences. One of the things I love when I talk to people, I often ask them, you know, tell me about where you're from. What was it like where you grew up? Because those things shape us. And it's beautiful that we all come from different places. And we've had different experiences with that. So make no mistake, the places mentioned in Scripture, the place where the Bible takes place, it has meaning and purpose. God used places to impact his people. So Jesus comes from Nazareth. But listen to this. He went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. Now, in the Old Testament, we never hear of Capernaum. It, it literally means village of Nahum. Nahum was an Old Testament prophet, and it, this was a village. We don't know if he lived there, or if he came from there, or if he just launched from there. We don't know, but it's known as the village of Nahum. And Jesus decides to establish his ministry there. Much like many of us, there's a season in all of our lives. You don't get to choose where you live. You're with your parents. You live where they live. You go where they go. But then as adults, you have that freedom. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to live? Where is God leading you? And Jesus goes to this town called Capernaum. This will be the base of his ministry. So make no mistake, this is a significant town that he goes to. Now I want to tell you a little bit about Capernaum. It wasn't a huge city. About 3,000 people, which us also wouldn't be considered really tiny at that time either. It's on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. I think I've got a map of it here, a second map you can see. There's Capernaum. It's up on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is known as some of the best freshwater fishing on earth. And in Israel, there's almost no water. Water is you're desperate for water. You need water. So a big water source like the Sea of Galilee is prized. It flows into the Jordan River. It feeds the Jordan. And the Sea of Galilee, also notice Capernaum. Do you see the red line coming down through there? That's called the Via Maris, meaning the way of the sea. And if you look in the, in the prophecy in verse 15, it says, Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, the way of the sea. The way of the sea was a road known as the Via Maris. That literally means way of the sea. And you would travel, if you were coming from Asia and going to Africa, this was the road. This was the road you took. And you can see over here on the far side where it hits the sea and runs along the sea. Now, I mentioned water was a prized commodity. So if you're traveling in the ancient world... Where are you going to stop? You're going to stop where you can get water. You're going to stop where you can get food. You're going to stop where you can get fish. So you would stop at Capernaum. Capernaum was a major pit stop along a major road. So realize this. The, though it was small, the entire world would travel through Capernaum. People from all backgrounds came through Capernaum. So Jesus, it's no accident that he sets up his ministry in Capernaum. Capernaum was also a military center. The Romans realized this is a significant city by its location. So they set up a military garrison there. We see that. Do you remember when they're talking about the, the um, synagogue in Capernaum? In Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 7, they say the centurion built the synagogue. And what's interesting, the synagogue in Capernaum, they've unearthed it, and they found a synagogue built on the foundation of the synagogue that the centurion built in Jesus' day. And it's one of the largest synagogues in all of Israel from the ancient world. So this synagogue actually became quite influential. So Jesus doesn't just go to any town. He goes to a strategic town because he's come for the world, and the world will pass through Capernaum. So he comes to this town, named Capernaum. It's in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Again, these words don't mean a whole lot to us probably, but Zebulun and Naphtali is two tribes of Israel. They were small, considered insignificant, and they were in the north, and what they endured was attacks. If you were going to come and try to fight Israel, the first place you would come from the north is this area. Notice it says in verse 16, 
People dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. For those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death. This area is known as a death area because there's so many attacks on this area. It's isolated. And that's where Jesus will come to establish his ministry. Notice all these things. It says Galilee of the Gentiles. That's how Galilee was known. Now, a Gentile, we've heard that term. It means simply this, non-Jewish. Anybody who's not Jewish is a Gentile. So the Jewish people looked down upon Gentiles and the fact that Galilee was surrounded by Gentiles and that many Gentiles traveled through it caused it to have a negative perception. Now in verse 17, we've seen some of the places, and again, we all could go through here and tell stories of places that have shaped us. We've seen a few people, not many yet, but now we're going to see Jesus come and make a proclamation in verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does that sound familiar? I know many of you have maybe been in church a while, so you're going, yeah, I've heard that before. But even recently, as we've been going through Matthew's gospel, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, John the Baptist preaches this message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preaches the exact same message as John the Baptist. He wants people to know, I'm with John. What John's been preaching, I'm the fulfillment of. He doesn't want there to be any doubt. John's now in prison. Jesus' ministry has started, and he preaches a message of repentance. I think it's one of the most powerful messages we can ever speak, ever preach. The idea of repentance is one of the most glorious ideas and understandings we have in all of Scripture. You see, repentance involves this. Recognizing that you have sinned, that you have done wrong, confessing it and going another way. For the Christian, here's what repentance looks like. I've sinned against a holy God. I confess that. I can't save myself. Jesus has never sinned, and I'm going to trust His salvation, for Him for salvation. I'm trusting His perfect life to replace my imperfect one. Substitution. He'll be a substitute for me. That's repentance. And listen, as Christians, you repent once for salvation. You say, I confess my sins, I need to be forgiven, and you repent and you are saved. But, don't miss this, to walk in the fullness that God has for you, you live a lifestyle of repentance. For the Christian, we live in repentance. It means when we see our sin, we confess it to God. I think there's an aspect of repentance that we often overlook. It's easy to overlook. It may be of an even more difficult aspect of repentance than repenting to God. And that's repenting to a brother or sister in Christ. We know we're not perfect. And there's times we do one another wrong. There's times we say things that hurt each other. There's times we do things that hurt each other. There's times that we sin against one another. And the best healing for that relationship, the best healing for you, and the freedom you can come, and come to a brother or sister in Christ and say, listen, I've done wrong against you, and I'm sorry. I don't want to do it again. That doesn't mean you won't because we're broken and fallen, but we don't want to. Marriage is so often struggle because there's no in-depth understanding of repentance within marriage, of coming to a spouse, saying, I've done wrong to you. I've hurt you by what I said, by what I've done. I've confessed it to God, and I want you to know I confess it to you. That brings healing. But let me tell you, that is hard. It's hard to confess to another person. It takes courage. It takes boldness. It takes a desire to walk in the fullness of Christ above all else that you would say, I will humble myself and say to someone else, I'm sorry, I've done wrong. Even for parents, get this. There's times that we repent to our children. There's times I've come to my children and I've said, listen, 
The way I spoke to you was not God honoring. And it was out of my anger and out of my fear and out of my own sinfulness. And I'm sorry. I believe as we do that, that teaches our children to repent. We model that before them. It's an important thing. But for a parent to do that, a parent who leads and guides their children, a parent who children often look at as parents have it all figured out, they're perfect in every way. That takes a great deal of humility, a great deal of wisdom. But I'll tell you, that'll bring more healing and strength to relationships than anything else. As Christians, we live a lifestyle of repentance. So Jesus comes and he proclaims the same thing. Repent, repent, repent of your sin. Why? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is coming in. That's who we are. We are kingdom people. Do you realize that? We live by the kingdom of God. This is not our home. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Now the world will say you're citizens of various countries. And that's true. But that's not your ultimate citizenship. The reason we gather here, we are all citizens of the same kingdom, gathering here to worship God. And that kingdom hasn't come in in its full. One day Jesus Christ will return. And when he does, he will usher in a kingdom in its fulfillment. But until that day comes, we live as kingdom people, ambassadors for a kingdom that hasn't arrived fully. So the kingdom's here. It's at hand. But it's not fully here. And when the world, when they see Christians repenting, forgiving one another, confessing, our world is so slow to confess any wrongs. We don't like to confess our own mistakes. But when the world sees that, that's attractive. That draws them, that wins them. So repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is Jesus' proclamation, and this should be our proclamation as a church. We should be proclaiming to the world, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. His kingdom is more glorious than any kingdom you could ever think of. It's more kingdom than any, more glorious than any kingdom you could build, that you could move to. His kingdom is glorious. And repent and enter into His kingdom. But not only do we proclaim that, we live at church for the world to see. So that's Jesus' message. Same as John the Baptist's message. Same message you and I are to preach. Now look at verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee. Now I've already mentioned the Sea of Galilee. Great freshwater fishing. Um, fabulous place. Beautiful place. You would, most of us would call it a lake. It's 13 kilometers wide. 21 kilometers long. That's not very big, but it's in a mountainous area. There's uh, mountain ridges all around it, and you can get winds coming down there that can stir that water. It can get really rough, so it's quite a dangerous endeavor. And it says, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, casting their net into the water to fish. Now, these two brothers, Jesus is going to call two sets of brothers here, James and John, Andrew and Peter. They're all fishermen. They're all from Galilee. Those four are from a town called Bethsaida and they're fishing out of Capernaum because Capernaum is a great place to fish because you can instantly sell your fish there. Do you know what would happen whenever you got done fishing? You'd have to pay taxes on those fish before you could sell them. And do you know who'd be there collecting those taxes? The guy who wrote this book. Matthew. Collecting taxes from Peter and Andrew and James and John, they knew each other, but I don't think they liked each other. Not at first anyway. So these guys are, are fishing, and Jesus comes and he makes a simple call. Follow me. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. A few things. Simple instruction. Here's our purpose in life. Follow Jesus. That's the me here. We've been building up in this book, seeing that he is uh, from the line of David, born of the virgin. He meets every Old Testament prophecy. He is the Messiah. Follow him. It's easy to follow in many ways, but it can also be very difficult. Following is not always easy. When you follow, you don't decide where you're going. You follow. You walk behind 
There's a leader and you walk with him and Jesus is our leader. We follow him. That's what we're called to do. And following can be beautiful and glorious and it can also be very difficult. But following involves this. Laying aside your agenda. Laying aside your goals. Laying aside your ambition. Sometimes laying aside your family. Sometimes laying aside your profession. Sometimes laying aside your hometown. Sometimes laying aside your country. It can involve laying aside all of those things in order to follow Jesus. Now many have followed Jesus here. All of us, I would say, have. Some from different parts of the world. Some have left family. Some have left nation. But God doesn't always call us to do that. We have to be willing to follow wherever He leads. Some He will say, go far away. Some will say, stay near. Our church is history. If you go back to when we started as what was called the Gospel Chapel in the 1940s, it was started by a group of people who said, we'll walk away from home and we'll walk away from family in order to follow where Jesus is leading. Now, I know this. Scripture talks about honoring your parents. So we have to be careful and keep these things in balance. We're to honor our family. We're to be respectful of our family. Children are to honor parents. Those are things that we see in Scripture. So he won't, everybody won't necessarily be called to physically leave, but some will. And here he says, follow me. And here's what he tells them. If you follow me, I'm going to make you into something. And this is the only thing in the totality of Scripture that Jesus says he's going to make his disciples. He doesn't say, I'm going to make you smarter. He doesn't say, I'm going to make you wealthier. He doesn't say, I'm going to make your life easier, more comfortable. He doesn't say, I'm going to make you a better athlete. He doesn't say, I'm going to make you uh, really good at business. He says, follow me, and what I'm going to make you is a fisher of men. That's his whole goal. That's what Jesus wants to make me into. That's what he wants to make you into. He wants to make us into fishers of men. And sometimes that may involve going far away. Sometimes that may involve being right where you are and fishing in your current job, in your current neighborhood with your family. But that's what he wants to do. Make us into fishers of men. That's what he was going to make these disciples into. He didn't say, I'll make you more spiritual or more disciplined or a better person or more honest or more holy. Though many of those things would happen. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Notice this in verse 20 and 22. It starts with the same word. The ESV says the word immediately. Immediately these guys follow Jesus. Now, that seems sort of strange. These guys are working as fishermen, and immediately they leave to follow Jesus. And we look at it and go, who in their right mind would leave if somebody came and said, follow me? Most people wouldn't. But know this. This is not their first encounter with Jesus. That's in John's gospel. In John's gospel, John the Baptist is speaking, and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Follow him. So they've already met Jesus here. They know who John has told them he is, and they are John's disciples. So they're going to follow Jesus when he says that. Also, in this culture, the most revered profession was a rabbi. As a parent, if your kid became a rabbi, oh, you'd be so proud of him. You couldn't wait to talk to people and say, well, my, my, my kid's a rabbi. Everybody else would be like, oh, you know, that's, that's a big deal. But rabbis, what they would do is they would memorize the entirety of the Old Testament. In order to be a rabbi, you had to know the whole Old Testament by memory. You learned the art of question and answer. You learned debate. You learned all sorts of things. And here's the way, at some point, if you were studying, if you weren't smart enough, if you didn't have enough scripture memorized, they'd say, listen, you can't be a rabbi. You need to go ply a trade. So what you would do? Jesus, he was a carpenter. I don't know if he was ever told that, but, you know, to go ply a trade, but he was a carpenter. You worked with your dad. We look at these guys, James and John, who are they working with? Their father, Zebedee. That's how you learn to work. In Jesus' day, most people's job was the exact same as their dad's. What does your dad do? That's what you're going to do. How do you learn to do it? You start working with your dad at age 13 and you work till you can take over. That's the way it worked. And then at some point, 
Your father, the father would be, be old enough that the sons would take over the business and take care of the father, and their boys would come in. And it was a cycle. It's the way it worked. So these guys are working as fishermen with their father, which tells us this. They weren't going to be rabbis. At some point, somebody said, you can't be a rabbi. They didn't have what it took to be a rabbi. All the disciples, at least 11 of them we know, they weren't formally educated. So Jesus comes and calls these guys who nobody else would have called to be his disciples. Jesus takes those who other rabbis would go, we don't want them. Jesus goes, I'll take them. Many of Jesus' calls are unique. They're actually men who are willing to take risk. A guy like Matthew who wrote this gospel, though he was a traitor to his people by collecting taxes, he's willing to endure scorn and shame from everybody else in order to work as a tax collector. You've got to have something to you to do that. All these fishermen... Fishing is one of the toughest jobs in ancient Israel, and it terrified most of the Jewish people. If you read through the Old Testament, you see no fishermen. You read through the Old Testament, you don't see any of the Jewish people going on the ocean or on the sea. The only one you see is Jonah, and he didn't like it very much. They didn't want to go on the water. The water was viewed as the abyss. So this was a risky job, a job you didn't want to take, a job you'd look and say, somebody else can do that. I remember when I was in high school, we went and visited a coal mines. And we went down, and I don't know if you, you have what you call underground coal mining. And we walked down this, into this pit, into this narrow, completely black cave. It had lights on. The roof was about this high, so we all had to duck. And there were men in there. And they would come there every day. And they'd work in this little place mining coal. And I remember going in there and being terrified. If you're claustrophobic, that means you don't like tight spaces. You're in a tight space. And I remember thinking, I could never do that. Lord, Lord, don't call me to do that. I can't do that. And just like I looked at coal mine and thought, Lord, that scares me. Most Jewish people would look at fishing and go, we're not going on the water. So know this, these fishermen had something different to them. They were willing to take risk. And Jesus calls these guys to come and follow him. Another reason they immediately follow is Jesus, we get from the other Gospels, had just told them to cast their net on the other side and they caught a lot of fish. So Jesus gave them proof. They had heard from John the Baptist, a testimony. And from their culture, they're going, we want to follow. So, of course, these guys immediately leave and they follow Jesus. Now in verse 23, it says he went throughout all of Galilee. He starts his ministry in this area of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Teaching, preaching, healing. That's how Jesus' ministry starts. Teaching in the synagogues, he came to the Jew first. Healing. Now, people will wonder about healing. I don't claim to be an expert or anything on it. But Jesus' healing ministry, he did it, I believe, for two primary reasons. One, his healing showed that he was Messiah. Why would a person be blind? Because sin exists in the world, and because this world is broken, our bodies are broken, and therefore this person's blind. It doesn't mean that person did anything to become blind or to deserve to be blind. That was a false belief in Jesus' day. They would often look and say, why is this person blind? Is it his mother or his father who sinned? And it's just their sin. Why do people get cancer? Because the world's broken. Sin happens. Why do natural disasters happen? Because the world feels the aches of sin. So there's general sin that hits everybody. And Jesus wants to show that he has power over sin. Do you remember when they lowered the guy on the mat down before Jesus? He says, your sins are forgiven. And they all say, nobody can forgive sins but God alone. And Jesus is going, yeah, that's right. I just forgave his sins. Who do you think I am? And then he says, I'll show you that I really could forgive his sins. Get up and walk. Why can't he walk? Sin. I have power over sin. Get up and walk. 
And he tells him to walk. So Jesus healed to show that he's Messiah. He also healed because he had great compassion on people. He had mercy on people. Now, I believe that God still heals today. In Scripture, we see in the time of Moses, in the time of Elijah, in the time of Jesus, three really large healing times within miraculous seasons within the Scriptures. I believe it seems to me that God prefers that we have faith in Him rather than faith in a miracle. So typically the miracles that God works are more normative. I mean, they're not always big and flashy. Now, I believe there's times He works those. Some of you may have experienced that. But I believe oftentimes the miracle that God works in our lives, the healings He brings, God's doing it. But He's often doing it through more normative means, through a doctor, through various things. God, God can work miracles all sorts of ways. I would say if you're here today and you need healing, let's say do what Scripture says. In James it says, come to the elders and they will pray for you. And God can bring healing. It's not a guarantee that if you come and have the elders pray for you, you're going to be healed. But you're stepping out in faith saying, God, I'm going to trust your word and I'm going to be obedient and come and ask for prayer for healing. And I believe God can do that absolutely. And I'll pray that he will. But it's God that's got to do that, and God knows far greater, far better than any of us. So Jesus comes, and part of his ministry is healing. He's healing the sick, the diseased, all these people. And it says great crowds from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, all over the region are coming to Jesus. So today we've seen a few little things. We've seen places, a lot of places mentioned here. I love hearing the places people are from. They've shaped us. People. We shape one another. A proclamation. We have, we proclaim something with our lives and a purpose. Our purpose can simply be boiled down to following Jesus. And as you follow him, he's going to make you into something. The challenge that I encounter, and I venture to say all of us encounter at some point in time, We start following after lesser things than Jesus. Things that won't really make a grand difference in eternity. I um, read a story about some killer whales. Now, I think I've got a picture of some killer whales up here. These are huge whales. They live out in California, United States, maybe other places. But if you put one on this stage, it would take the whole stage. They're huge. And these are huge animals. And these killer whales that are designed to live out in a massive ocean traveled all the way up a river until it became a stream, until this happened. They were beached and they began to die because they went where they weren't designed to go. Do you know why they went there? They were chasing something. Here's what they were chasing. These are called minnows. Minnows are among the smallest type of fish. They're tiny. You can see them in that guy's hand. And these killer whales, these massive whales, traveled up a river into a stream to their death following little minnows. They could eat all the minnows they want and they would still be hungry. There's no amount of minnows they could eat that would satisfy their whale belly. The minnows are too small. And we have to guard against chasing after things that we think will fill our belly, that we think will satisfy us. But no matter how much we eat, no matter how much we take it, it'll never satisfy us. No amount of fame in this world, no amount of success, no amount of money, no amount of praise, no amount of any of that will ever satisfy our soul. No, we can only live the way we're designed to live is when we follow after Jesus and we chase after Him and we say, I'm willing to leave it all behind in order to follow Him because He is the great prize. He's greater than anything. Church, I pray that we avoid the temptation to follow after lesser things and that we follow Jesus' simple yet glorious and powerful command to follow him.
And that in doing so, he will make us into fishers of men. Let's pray. God, I do thank you for your word. It's true. Lord, I thank you for each person gathered today to worship you. I pray that we have worshipped you and we will continue to worship you. And Lord, you've brought us all here for a reason. We need other people. You brought us to this place for a reason. You use places to shape us. And there's so many here in this room that could share testimony of how you use this church, this place, to impact their lives. Lord, may we be people who live boldly for your purpose. May we proclaim the glorious news of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Whether we declare it in exactly those words or we declare it in uh, another way, Lord, may we continually declare that to people. Lord, may our great prize and joy be found in you. Lord, there are some here today who are hurting, who are broken, who are afraid. I pray that they would follow you. Lord, there are some today who we call lost, and they haven't trusted you. They still trust in their own works and efforts. I pray that they would trust in the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice and follow you. And Lord, I pray over all the situations and the works we do and the places we work and the people we work with. May we be faithful to follow you in those places. Lord, we pray over Ethiopia. We're so grateful that you brought each of us here. There are those who've been here their entire lives, praise God. And there's some like me who've been here much shorter. Lord, we thank you that you bring us here, that you bring us to this place, that you allow this place to be a part of our journey here on earth, and that you use this place to shape us more into your image and to be a place that, Lord, I pray that we are faithful to fish for men as we live here. Lord, may you be glorified in all that we do as you work in and through us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.